Okay, hello again. This is your video lecture for our next book, Esmeralda Santiago's memoir, When I Was Puerto Rican. I am uh, in the basement today, so get a nice uh, dungeon-like appearance in the background, but don't let that distract you. Um, I won't let it distract me. So, last week we we looked at the novel from our Cuban immigration period, and this week we're looking at a similar relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico as expressed in Santiago's writing. What's interesting, and, and I gave you a little bit of history of, of Cuba and the United States relationship last week, uh, what's interesting is how Puerto Rico sort of is engulfed in that same sort of historical uh, relationship. Uh, as I told you in preceding videos, uh, the Cuban War of Independence, which started in 1895 and resulted in, in what we know as the Spanish-American War that ended in 1898, was also part of Puerto Rico's independence movement from Spain. And this came on the heels at the end of the 19th century of several different skirmishes between uh, Cuban-led uh, revolutions and uh, Spanish colonists, uh, in which the United States paid a little attention or really didn't get involved too much until um, the ultimate moment that, that sort of ushers in the, the presence of the United States when the battleship Maine was blown up uh, in 1898. And this uh, really sort of ushers in the age of the United States' uh, siding with the, the rebellion in order to oust Spain as a, as a colonial presence in the Caribbean. And if you look up, and if you if you know any history yourself of the the explosion on the main, you'll you'll know or you'll hear people say that there are some cloudy circumstances surrounding uh, how exactly this battleship blew up, who was at fault, whether it was under the attack of the Spanish army or whether it was you know an accident or or to an extreme, perhaps even the United States blew it up. Uh, under their own watch, in order to have reason to uh, get involved in this in this conflict in the Caribbean, um, Howard Zinn, in fact, the the famous writer about um, people's history. In fact, his most famous work is probably the long tome "People's History of the United States." He has a book uh, that's a graphic novel description of a people's history of, uh, I believe it's U.S. Empire or something like that, in which he describes this uh, at length being played out in the newspapers uh, and and the the sort of shoddy reportage that goes along with, with uh, this description. In any case, the United States gets involved in this war, turns it into the Spanish-American War, and after... Um, the war is over, as we learned in our, our last week's discussion. Uh, the United States presence in the Caribbean, in, in Cuba and in Puerto Rico and in, in other parts becomes sort of the replacement for the Spanish colonial model that had been there for, for years. Um, the end of the war... Uh, uh, begins the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico uh, that's a little bit different than the Cuban one. Officially, uh, in 1900, the Four Acre Act gave Puerto Rico local rights. They could install their own civilian popular government. They existed as a, a commonwealth of the United States for almost 50 years. And in 1947... The U.S. gave Puerto Rico right to elect their own governor uh, democratically. So, uh, and along the way, there were some other um, 
small movements forward in in giving Puerto Rico some sovereign uh, status, but also having them as a protectorate under the United States. And we we if you remember from last week, uh, this is a little different than how Cuba was treated. Okay, and what happens during this time is is that the United States, both culturally, economically, and uh, socially, uh, influences the Puerto Rican lifestyle. And what we'll see as you read Santiago's memoir is the presence of an American uh, neo-colonial identity that sort of is played out in Santiago's uh, memories here. She's looking back, and there are several scenes, especially early on, where she describes the dominance of the American uh, cultural and capital uh, identity as part of what she remembers when she was a young girl in Puerto Rico. Now, she was born in San Juan in 1948, and she moved to the United States. She immigrated to the United States when she was a teenager, 13. Uh, And during that whole time, she, she was writing... Uh, stories, poems, just little things, journals, diaries. And she was very, very artistic uh, in her youth in a way that she was urged to be creative. And in fact, she attended a high school for performing arts in the, in the U.S. And she worked on films, uh, I believe dancing and other writing, just ways to be more expressive than a, a traditional Uh, high school education. She was the oldest of 11 children and she describes being put in charge of them. She was a a mother figure in a lot of ways uh, which is in in some Latino families very typical that the oldest will will take on this this parental role so that the, the parents are able to work and to to do other things that the family needs. Um, Her writing, Santiago's writing, has has been driven primarily by her experiences as a young female Latina immigrant and all the elements that go along with this, right? And and in this memoir, we see, you know, all of these things represented. Culture shock, fascination with a, a new land and a new language and a new people, uh, certainly some resistance, you know, her own culture and identity are being subverted and replaced, so there's an obvious uh, tendency to resist some of this. Um, she gets specific when it comes to language language acquisition, uh, particularly in the later parts of, of this memoir. And then this more general, vague concept of, of how she and and other immigrants like her have to sort of re-embody what it means uh, to call something home and what, what exactly that term and that concept plays with. Uh, I'll take just a couple minutes to, to sort of riff on, if you look on the, the schedule, it, it has uh, a place for me to talk about what's often called testimonio, um, and what this is, is, is it's a brand or a subgenre of, of storytelling that has at its roots um, first-person agency, right? This, this idea of creating your own perspective to help shape others' understandings of the world. And memoir and oral history and autobiography contain elements of testimony or testimonio that um, scholars have, have differentiated by saying that they not, not only seek to report the world, but also to change it. And Santiago's memoir hits on some of these elements as she is, is largely driven by, by memory, right? If you even look at the opening preface where she begins to... to to you know, conjure herself back to when she was a child, as compared to where she is at the present of this writing, you know she's she's 
driven by this idea that she needs to represent clearly the difference in order for herself and for her readers to understand and to, to comprehend what it is that, that exists within her. And testimonial allows uh, that, that sort of agency-defining, identity-defining narrative to be in the hands of the storyteller. Um, this is an element that's you know very, very powerful and present in immigrant first-person narratives because we get this, this sense of being uh, along for the ride, so to speak, but also because we, we are meant to feel the, the sort of uh, washed over um, erasure and oftentimes self-erasure, self-effacement of one's own particular uh, importance throughout the process. And so by Santiago employing many of these types of, of uh, techniques in her writing and many, many of these goals in her writing, she's producing yeah, beautiful memoir that gives you know the story of her past and where she came from, but also the, this powerful uh, you know expanding idea of who she is and who other immigrants like her, particularly young women, young Latinas, are uh, in the grand narrative, right? And it's important. I should tell you here that this this. Uh, first part of a three-part memoir was published in 1994. When I Was Puerto Rican is, is the, the first of a trilogy. There are, are two other parts. Uh, 1999 saw the publication of Almost a Woman, and 2004, uh, The Turkish Lover came out. And they all are, are connected to this, this memory-driven, agency-defining narrative style that, sh that she creates here. Um, originally, this book, When I Was Puerto Rican, was published simultaneously in English and in Spanish, which is um, not uncommon for, for immigrant writers to do. Um, the style of this book is very, very uh, clean. It's very confessional. It's humorous at times. And I've heard people say in the past that it almost reads like a love letter to to uh, her Puerto Rican childhood. It is, it's sentimental, but it's also rough. You know, it's also very uh, um, raw in some places. And if you've read, you know, the first hundred pages or so, you, you understand what I mean. But there's a very uh, prominent display of, of grasping all of the shameful parts of her familial life. And, and this is part of testimonio as well. You, you, you probe these areas that, that aren't often told and, you know, that would, on a familial narrative level, usually areas that you don't want to poke on too much. Uh, testimonio or, or uh, you know, first-person narratives often will, will be served better by probing those a little bit. And she, she is certainly um, not gliding over those parts of, of her um, childhood in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's very true to the memoir genre, though. She carefully sort of pulls memories together and creates a mood or sort of a takeaway feeling, an element that helps her, you know, attach meaning to the memories. You know, like this particular scene, she'll craft very very nicely in an effort to give you what it is that she feels now in the present day rather than, you know, um, simply trying to call this happened. You know, she wants these memoir memories to create uh, a, a bit of a, an overarching feeling and give you the sense of what happened to her. Uh, and often memoirs we know contain a bit of creative license, maybe you know, combining some images, combining some some moments from her past into you know one, or creating things out of order, etc. You know, compiling characters even, um, like some of the young children she she was friends with 
all of that is is uh, sometimes employed in um, uh, memoir writing. Some of the things that you're going to notice as you read through, obviously there are some some very specific treatments of the men and women relationships as well as their their distinct ways of, of being sort of how do I want it characterized in this culture right the no, the novel the memoir is interesting in that it, it, it sort of straddles Puerto Rico and and um, New York uh, in a way that allows us to see what's going on between not only Negi, as she's called it in, in her memoir, uh, but also her mother and, and people who are important to her, her father and her, and her sisters, you know, how they deal with, with this transition differently. Uh, and so along the way, we, we begin to see that there's a double standard dominating the men and the women. And early on, this is much more explicit, but it doesn't go away in, in the American setting. And so uh, Santiago, in looking at this, is, is sort of pulling on some threads, not super severely, but just pondering these, these elements of, of sexism that are embedded within her own culture and that you know, also express themselves here in the United States when she arrives. And she, she, like the child's voice that she's portraying here, is, is learning or she's, she's sort of grasping these things slowly in a way that, that brings her into to, uh, a young girl by the end of, of the, the memoir. Um, the point of view is from later in her life, I should mention. It, it, it takes that, that stance where she's writing these things and the voice that tells us these things indicates that she's had time to remember and, and to think about what this looked like in her life. And that affects her tone. That affects you know the, the humor and the sadness and the, the sort of knowing nature that is there when she relates something like like the the presence of the American uh, uh, corporations that tell her family and the others what the children should be eating and you know replacing the way that they've done things for years and years and years, there's a knowing sense of of this this element of you know cultural hegemony you know being sort of imposed upon and what that looks like in the grand scheme of things and she she comes to that not with a sort of ignorance but she, you know there's this expression that that is is implied in the writing that shows her readers you know look at this this step that the the Americans were taking to sort of indoctrinate us with their their cultural values and their social norms etc um, and all of this to set up how she will engage full on with the American lifestyle later. How will this affect her? And this is something that you know, by the end of this part of her trilogy, we're able to see that, that she is, um, how do I want to say without giving too much away, she's brought up to sort of a... a a generic American version of what a young woman should be, very similar to some of what Maxine Han Kingston was going through in The Woman Warrior. And we see that um, she is uh, averse to this, but then later sort of wrangles with where this will be uh, as she's going forward. Um, just to throw it back for a minute, we could compare this to to her continued um, discussion or portrayal of uh, the Hebras, the the you know country people who are not cultured, who who have sort of a roughness to them, and 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 the way that the people consider them uh, is certainly by looking down on them, but also devaluing them as a sort of relics, as antiquity, and, and as people who they do not want to be. Um, 
this is something that, that Santiago wrestles with early on, and it sort of changes shape a little bit later. In much the same way that Cesar and Nestor in uh, the Mambo Kings are, are dealing with their sort of grappling on to pieces of American culture, uh, Santiago's voice here uh, is doing that both at home, quote-unquote home, in Puerto Rico, and when she arrives in New York as well. Um, femininity itself, in fact, uh, you know, is expressed in a variety of different forms. Early on, hibras, you know, are, are a certain type of women. A uh, little bit of a spoiler alert when she learns of her father's uh, other family and the women that, that would be involved in that type of thing teach her something. And then later when she arrives in the United States and she begins to see femininity is you know, sort of divided into sexualized versions and, and sort of pure or prudent versions and, and the way that this you know, really divides her sense of who she is, not just as an immigrant but as a woman, as a, as a Latina woman. Um, some of the other subjects that you might want to look at you know, I, I mentioned certainly men and women, but also the duality of the, of the gender role standards, right? There's a scene early, and it's really early, where, where um, she, she has a throwaway line, and, and I always refer to this when I teach this book, about, you know, um, none of the men came to these information meetings about how to feed your children, this and that, because it was not men's work to do. This was women's work that was being done. And, and even the way that she states this sort of inflects the idea that this was just an understood part of that cultural scene. But she does make a point to tell us this, right, because she knows her readers may not have that same sort of understanding. Um, you might also look at, uh, at the larger concept of movement. We've talked about movement in, in several books so far this semester, and it's a sort of overarching theme of our class. Uh, movement throughout this uh, memoir is, is played out in, in a number of different ways. So you, it, it could be something that simply has to do with, yeah, moving from Puerto Rico to the United States, but also what parts of herself move in different directions, right? The parts of her, of her sort of introspective self-identity narrative hang back or move later or, you know, when she's in the United States at the beginning and she's looking, you know, all of this movement is sort of represented uh, by its, its divergent um, narrative in some way. Uh, and then lastly, there's the, the idea of education and not just, you know, formal education, but we, we talk about this as a part of a trilogy. We could also look at it, the trilogy itself as a memoir, but it's a, it's a, a backwards looking Bildungsroman, a coming of age narrative where she's educated in a variety of things along the way. And she, she takes the time to, to grow her character or her point of view uh, it, as we said earlier, it might be through creative license, but there is a building of ways that, that she learns um, who to be and who uh, she believes she can be. So just a couple of questions that I'll leave you with, things that you might want to consider writing about in your reading response. Um, how does the treatment of American immigration make a step forward here? Uh, as opposed to uh, in Ijuelos' novel, uh, you know, we, we have certainly women are involved here, but also we, we understand that, that Santiago's uh, immigration coincides with the advancement of Chicano and Latino civil rights consciousness of, of the 60s and into the 70s. And is that reflected anyway here? Certainly. Uh, there's an advancement of, of feminist agenda, but also uh, what about a cultural presence in, in there as well? Um, we might ask and, and probe a little bit more about the revealing nature of, of memoir in general. We talked, or I talked early on about, you know, probing shame and pain and, and secrets from one's family life as a way to get a fuller picture of who one is. We, we mentioned that when we looked at Kingston's The Woman Warrior and that the novel opens with an 
uh, uh, spreading of, of a shameful secret that had heretofore been, you know, unrecognized. Now, what what does that play in the crafting of, of this narrative here, that idea of, of shame and pain? Uh, and then la- lastly, we might simply just ask, uh, in a more general sense, uh, assimilation and, and integration of, of immigrants, you know, becomes a... a large part of the second half of this this memoir you know what is what does that do for for identity and and writers in particular because we're going to also be looking uh at santiago particularly as a storyteller right we talked or i mentioned uh that that this is uh, testimonial like in that it's her you know, very much needing to tell this story, just like Kingston needs to control the story. She needs to be the storyteller for her family. Well, in, in crafting a memoir, there's that sort of implied impetus as well. So uh, assimilation and integration uh, are a part of, of one's own identity. How does that change the way that she tells the story and her purpose for telling the story? Uh, think about those things. There are a lot of other things as well. Certainly the book has, has uh, more humor in, in some ways, and it, it's, it almost reads as a, as a, a young adult or, or adolescent um, narrative in some ways, but it's, it's very, very um, appropriate in the context of our class in, in that she wants to show that she and and when she wrote this, I know I I'm not sure that she envisioned sequels to this, but she wants to show that first step towards uh, her immigration process as being very very uh, much a creative part of who she ultimately becomes, and that's why she opens with that present day scene. Okay, good luck with the reading responses. Uh, I will see you next week. Uh, remember, if you're not following along with the schedule, we are reading the entirety of this book this week. So um, uh, do try to finish it and bef- before you submit your reading response. And I'll be back with you shortly. Good luck. <laughs>